Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Paco Calvo. He is a professor at the University of Murcia in Spain, where he leads the Minimal Intelligence Lab, focusing on the study of minimal cognition in plants. And today we're focusing on his book, Planta Sapiens, the New Science of Plant Intelligence. So, Paco, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to have you on. Hi. Hi, everyone. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So before we get into the plants themselves, perhaps just to introduce the topic also, because I think that framing the way we're talking about intelligence here is very, impor is very important from the very beginning of our conversation. Sure. So could you tell us uh, what is intelligence? Exactly? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I wish I knew, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get started with humans rather than plants, right? Let's get started mm -hmm. with humans. Well, right. actually, even if you think of the very title of the book, Planta Sapiens, just go to what we all have in mind, Homo sapiens, right? Mm -hmm. so, so even if you think of Homo sapiens, people won't agree as to what they mean by human intelligence, right? right. So you will find different people, different researchers coming from different schools of thought, and they will all have uh, from, you know, provided the different backgrounds, they will have different approaches to the very notion of human intelligence. So these two issues we have to, 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 to solve here. One is, what do we mean by intelligence when applied customarily to the case of humans and or other animals? And how can we stretch it to bring in, to incorporate the intelligence of, of non-human and non-animal organisms in the tree of life, right? So, uh, the, I, I guess that the first thing we should bear in mind, uh, because this is something that many people have asked before, is that, is that hey, people say, hey, Paco, nice trick to call your book Planta Sapiens, but aren't you speaking metaphorically? Is that not a metaphor? And so the first thing to bear in mind is that, no, it's not metaphorical thinking. It's not a, a stylistic trick. We do mean to say that plants are sapient in the very same way that we mean to say that humans are sapient. So your, your first question is right on target. What, what is it, intelligence? What's intelligence after all, right? Yeah. So imagine um, um, that we try to find out what intelligence is in the case of, you know, non-human animals. You know, mm -hmm. your pet, your dog, a cat, primates, mm, whales, dolphins, right. you name it. Uh, you could say, first thing is that we... Intelligence is something you cannot observe directly, right? right? So you, we just couldn't I, observe directly and pinpoint it and say, hey, look, I am observing intelligence. No, you might say, I'm observing intelligent behavior. Right. So the type of behavior that is sophisticated enough to deserve the label, right? So that's important to bear in mind because now we are on the same page. Mm -hmm. We are not speaking about a, a feature, a property. Yeah specific to humans and then we say hey now what do we do with it when we apply to other creatures mm -hmm. we say oh let's check out the behavioral repertoire the patterns of behavior of any species whatsoever and then as a function of the degree of complexity of sophistication that that behavior uh, uh, is able to accomplish we will say oh that's the type of behavior that we call intelligent behavior now, I would say that intelligent behavior is the type of behavior that is not just adaptive. So we are not speaking of adaptations that wouldn't be, you know, of course, plants are here because they are well adapted. Otherwise, they would have, you know, become extinct. Mm -hmm. So if they are here, they, they definitely they've, they've got something that they are doing OK. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are intelligent. Right. So on top of behavior being adaptive, we want the type of behavior that they exhibit to be flexible enough and to be anticipatory. They've got to be able to predict the future, mm -hmm. to know what's going to happen next, to be able to tune to future regularities. Otherwise, they could be just like reacting to environmental regularities. And we don't, we don't want them to simply react to light and say, oh, look, nice phototropic behavior. That's not intelligent. That's just a reaction to light. So we need something else, the capacity of plants to integrate all sorts of information and provide a response that is globally adaptive and flexible at a global scale, at the level of the whole plant. And then in so far as they are able to do it, 
while targeting their goals. So it's goal-directed behavior, flexible goal-directed behavior. is anticipatory, flexible goal-directed behavior. Then I think we are on the same page. If we isolate it, if we identify that type of behavior in an animal, wouldn't we call it intelligent behavior when the same applies to plants? That's mm -hmm. kind of one of the main theses of the book. Okay, and so uh, during our conversation, we're going to go through some of the behaviors that you go through in the book, mm -hmm. because I think that giving illustrative examples of what you mean by intelligence here is easier for people to understand. But just before we get into the behaviors themselves, mm -hmm. do you think that it is necessarily the case that animals, plants, or any other kind of living organism needs to have neurons or nervous systems for it to have some sort of intelligence? Oh, oh not at all. Actually, you see, that's, that's actually, that's, that's um, yeah, perfect, because uh, that's a good way to frame it. Because, of course, reason for skepticism, number one, is, hey, plants have no neurons, plants mm -hmm. have no brains, plants have no nervous system. Yeah. How the heck can you defend that they are intelligent? Of course, the easiest way to understand how, despite lacking neuronal tissue or neural hardware, plants can still be competent and intelligent is to realize that that sort of tissue was a type of adaptation, a trait that evolved for insofar as they needed a rapid way, fastness, a rapid way to go through their problems, right? Mm -hmm. So, in fact, many people say, you know, they think like, hey, plants, plants can't afford to be stupid. You know, they are sessile, they are rooted, they don't move around. They can afford to be stupid, but we animals, have to run fast to hide from predators, to go out and hunt, you know, all this prey and prey competition, all that, we wouldn't be able to do it to survive unless we had some fast mechanism to convey messages, to coordinate body responses, right? So of course we found the trick, which is, you know, electrical signaling through a neural tissue in our mm -hmm. case. Yeah. But that only means that that trick paid off in our case. That doesn't mean to say that, that it's got to be the same trick that any other form of life founds, finds, right? Mm -hmm. So in the case of plants, you could say, hey, precisely because they are rooted, because they are sessile, that doesn't mean they are stupid. That means they've got to find some other trick to do well. In their case, it's a divide and conquer strategy. They are fully mm -hmm. decentralized. So rather than saying, hey, you've got to be fast to hide, you know, to do mm -hmm. the things animals are supposed to be doing, yeah. we, you say, hey, no, no, they can just decentralize resources. They don't need to find or to locate their essential, their special organs anywhere on their body plan. They can just say, no, no, everything is fully decentralized. So if we did chop a, a branch off, they would grow another branch. In your case, you better, you know, make sure you keep both arms safe because you won't grow another arm. Right. So we have different body morphologies, different anatomies, different ways to move around, different needs. Because of course, we say plants can't afford to be stupid because they are sessile, but plants could say, hey, you've got to be a bit stupid. You can't make up your own food. You've got to go shopping. I mean, come on. So we have different problems and we come up with different solutions. In their case, the type of solutions that they found don't require neurons or a brain uh, and uh, i mean one of the ideas that you convey in the book if i got it correctly is that even if organisms are built from different blueprints it doesn't necessarily mean that they have completely different capacities i mean they might have some mm. similar capacities well, well right. absolutely i mean that's that's uh, uh, that's the name of the game in evolution you know I mean, we can get to find similar solutions coming from different uh, origins, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, actually, you know, I always, I, I like to think of the example of, of, of vision. Think of vision, right? Mm -hmm. uh, imagine you were in this planet, we're scouting, we're exploring this planet we just discovered, and you only find vertebrates, vertebrate creatures with camera type eyes, right? So the okay. type of eyes we vertebrates have. Right, the concave mm -hmm. camera type eye. So you never, you've never come across an insect, an invertebrate, 
you know, the guys that have compound eyes. Compound eyes, but rather than concave, they, they, they exploit a different trick to, to deal with to formation in the form of images, right? right? So imagine you only knew vertebrates and that you concluded that only vertebrates can see because only vertebrates have camera type eyes. That would be really narrow minded. When you come across an insect without camera type eyes, instead of saying that the insect has got to be blind, you could say, hey, it came across a different solution. They evolved complex uh, compound eyes. So if this is the same as with neural tissue. Oh, they found a different trick. A compound mm -hmm. eye allows them to see differently. So they okay. see through different mechanisms and yet they both see. So we can have capacities that are similar, functionally speaking, coming from different ends. Mm -hmm. But do you think that, and this is a question that we'll come back to later after we go through some of the behaviors we ex you explore in the book and try to understand why we might be able to label them intelligent or not. But do you think that it is reasonable, at least to some extent, to at least initially maintain some degree of skepticism when it comes to comparing plants to animals? Oh, absolutely. So, you, oh, de definitely. So, but that's that's how sh science should proceed. Mm -hmm. Now, skepticism by nature is the default stance. So we should all be careful in doing science. Mm -hmm. The mistake, the mistake is to remain a skeptic simply because they don't have neurons and mm -hmm. you maintain that because they lack neurons, they cannot possibly think or they cannot possibly behave intelligently. Is the default position, but not with plants, with any form of life. So you should remain a skeptic. You should remember that we have to try to falsify our empirical hypothesis. We are testing different hypotheses different conjectures, and we need to retain a healthy degree of skepticism to have solid. But in, I insist that should apply across the board. A different issue is that we are less skeptic in one field because we have a biased approach with our prejudices, human-centered prejudices, and we don't apply the same me measuring rod. So we should apply the same measuring rod, the same gold standard, regardless of the kingdom of precedence, regardless of where our organisms come from, if it's the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, fungi, or whatever. But definitely, if we are skeptical in all fields, that's good news. If we are only skeptical in one field and not the other, we are being biased and have prejudices. Mm -hmm. uh, also, because we tend to have this sort of this relationship or way of thinking about even also non-human animals, but even more mm -hmm. so plants, where on the one hand we have a zoocentric uh, perspective mm -hmm. where we think that only animals and sometimes just humans can be sure. intelligent, can have minds and so on. But sure. on the other hand, sometimes we very easily are anthropomorphic and attribute it very Absolutely. easily, too easily attribute mm. uh, capacities yeah. or abilities to other animals and Absolutely. plants that perhaps uh, they yeah. might not have. Absolutely. So that's why it's very, very important not to overinterpret the data. So mm -hmm. one mistake is to overinterpret the data, mm -hmm. to think that the data justifies you into this leap thinking, oh, I can go beyond data, affords me. That's, that's what I meant by healthy skepticism. So we've got to make sure our data, our evidence is robust enough to allow us to, you know, go beyond to, right? Now, think what you mentioned about uh, uh, the risk of anthropomorphizing. Here, the problem is a different one, regardless of how skeptical we are or not, is that mm -hmm. we are using ourselves as the gold standard. Right. And that is the reason why, I mean, if when we are searching for intelligence in the animal within the animal kingdom, remember what we are doing. We first we get started with those animal species that are closer to us. Like okay, let's mm -hmm. check out primates, yeah. or let's check out mammals because they have a neocortex. 
oh, these guys with the neocortex, they've got to be, you know, smart enough because, you know, we, we are the guys with neocortex. We can play good games with this. This is a hierarchical structure. We can, you know, play with degrees of abstraction. Oh, it's, it's, it's a, I mean, it comes really handy to have a neocortex, right? Uh, but then, if you go to the history of the cognitive sciences and in the animal, animal cognition literature, what we see nowadays is that we are opening up the landscape and considering seriously, despite that healthy skepticism, considering seriously the possibility that, that non-mammalian animals, birds, cephalopods, insects, that mm -hmm. many other animal forms of life that do not have a neocortex still are intelligent, exhibit mm -hmm. an intelligent behavior sophisticated enough, complex enough, flexible enough, anticipatory enough, all these features yeah. we mentioned, right? And then, if you think, what's the reason why we are able to do that, is that despite that initial hunch that we say, hey, let's get started with whichever guys are closer to me in the tree of life, right? Mm -hmm. Then we say, okay, once we get started there, let's go down, let's open up, let's spread out, let's explore more widely. And then once you are ready to do that, which means in a sense you are jettisoning, you are getting rid of those prejudices, mm -hmm. then you are able to start appreciating other behavioral repertoires. Oh, wow, check out what honeybees are able to do. Honeybees are amazing things, are doing amazing things. You know, they have even numerical abilities, now we know, or mm -hmm. chicks, birds. So maybe you don't require a neocortex to have some proto-numerical abilities as we now know from birds or insects, you see? So the idea is that maybe the mistake is to get started up the ladder with us and then compare their degree of intelligence insofar as it relates to me as if I am providing the gold standard. Uh -huh. So what is it that, that I'm doing in Planta Sapiens? What I'm saying is like, let's, let's do it in reverse order from the bottom up not from the top down. So let's get started, you know, as distant as possible from, from, from we animals. So not mm -hmm. just the primates or the mammals or whoever is closer to me, but the other way around, whoever is farther away from me. Mm -hmm. So you have plants that have no neurons, have no brains, no nervous system, fully decentralized, they are sessile, they don't move around. Oh, these guys are so different, they cannot be intelligent. And then you say, hold on a sec, let's, let's get started that other way from the distance. Because if you find if you find sophisticated behavioral repertoires in them, then you might hit upon something which is the master key that unlocks the door yeah. intelligence in the tree of life. So if they are doing their own things with their own type of tissue, non-neural tissue, with completely different back of tricks, and they still are here doing well we might be unearthing, being able to identify something that unites us all in the tree of life, regardless, mm -hmm. regardless of the particularities of the different tricks that we all have evolved, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe anthropomorphizing itself sometimes is a problem. Uh, let, let, let me put it another way. When, when I find people who are skeptical about my position, when I say, for example, plants, I suspect that they are sentient. Right? Mm -hmm. And then people go like, come on, Paco, you're crazy or what? How could plants possibly be sentient? You know why they get so annoyed or so, wow? Because they cannot think of sentience without a human eye. Yes. They think that sentience equates to human sentience. Mm -hmm. And that's to me the best proof, the best example, the best way to illustrate that the ones who are anthropomorphizing plants are themselves. And that's why they are so skeptical. They say, come on, that's cannot, that cannot be possible. How could the plants, because they think we are projecting human experience onto them. Mm -hmm. Now, get rid of yourself, think wide, think different, more universally, and then you will understand that we are not trying to anthropomorphize them. We are deflating human cognition, deflating human sentence, to put it on a par with the rest of intelligences in the tree of life. Mm -hmm. But how exactly do plants behave? 
Because it, it, I mean, at first sight, it sounds very weird to talk about mm. plants behaving because apparently, at least most of them are just there, fixed yeah. in the ground. Yeah. yeah, they apparently do not move yeah, much yeah, at yeah. all. So, I mean, let's perhaps start with this. Tell us about uh, what do you call movement by growth? Of yeah, plants that's, that's, the... that's a great example. So just, just. Just think what we mean by behavior, right? To understand behavior in the form of growth, right? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, actually, I use I use in the book a definition like to to highlight how narrow-minded we are being. So I, I think I was using like the, like the the, the, the Penguin uh, Dictionary of Psychology definition or the Oxford Dictionary. I think it was the Penguin Dictionary definition, like like you know behavior. Behavior is like, you know, just it's just a generic term that is covering, you know, the types of activities, responses, reactions, right. movements, mm -hmm. processes, you know, you know, any 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 type of response that you can measure. Okay? So yeah. that's that's what I meant about widening up. Because if 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 by behavior we just meant the type of movement that you exhibit, you animal that locomotes. And then we say, yeah, sure, that type of response in the form of locomotion, I can measure it, I can, you know, I can study it scientifically, how this organism behaves, how it moves around. So if you think of behavior in these broader terms, plants also behave. Now, plant behavior is to be understood in the form of growth, of development. So there are patterns of growth, pattern of development, we call it phenotypic plasticity. So there is a degree of plasticity in their phenotype that constitutes their behavior. Now, their behavior can take many forms. They can grow, we said before, in a goal-oriented manner. So they can grow towards a target. So they can reach their goals. The only thing is that they reach their goals not by locomoting, not by moving towards them, but by growing instead towards them. So they reach their goals, right? So you have elongation. Now, you, when you have differential elongation, so one side elongates more than the other, then it can turn. So you can see how the tip of the shoot of a vine, for example, a climbing plant, will turn towards the target. Now, you can have different patterns of behavior. It doesn't need to be growth mediated. Mm -hmm. So think, think of nastic responses. So the type of movements we are studying you think of, for example, of directional responses, like like phototropic response, geotropic response. So I'm, I'm directionally following light, or I'm directionally following the gravity vector, or I'm directionally following a chemical gradient. Mm -hmm. So I'm following a target in right. the direction of the target. So that's a tropic response, right? I can measure it. We can speak of plant behavior in the form of a tropistic response, right? Mm -hmm. But you can also have nastic responses, which are non-directional responses, right? Think of think of leaves folding and unfolding. So some plants, you can touch them and they fold their leaves. One of the examples we use in the book is mimosa, right? The mimosa pudica, right? Yeah. And non-directional responses. And of course, you have those at the level of the air part of the plant, the shoots, the leaves, the, the tips, and also below ground. So roots will be behaving in the very same way. They will mm -hmm. search for nutrients. They will be scanning, exploring the surroundings for water, for nutrients. So all these things are taking place. That's the type of behavior mediated by growth in some cases, or not by growth in other cases, but still responses to environmental uh, information impinging on the sensory surface of the plant. But do plants have any kind of tissue that you would say is equivalent to muscles in animals? Okay, okay, that's yeah, that's that that's a good question because I'm aware that here some people get confused with the terminology. Uh, if you if you wanted to check for the direct counterpart to muscles, like the direct counterpart you, you wouldn't find that as such, right? Mm -hmm. So so sometimes uh, when some researchers speak of muscles, they are they mean like like actually they, they speak of some of them speak of the molecular muscle of trees. So the muscles of trees at the molecular level. 
thinking of, of the cellulosic fibers, cellulose, mm -hmm. the fibers themselves, because, because uh, in those gelatinous fibers, you find the possibility to generate tensional stress for the sake of contraction, of expansion. So sometimes you have features that can be understood as muscle-like at the molecular mm -hmm. level, right? Mm -hmm. so, so as such, you don't actually have a direct counterpart. You have a functionality that allows them to play a similar role sometimes. Okay. So what you have is the combination. In fact, what you do have is the combination of some specialized cells, motor cells. You have turgor pressure. You have inflation and deflation of the vacuoles. You have growth hormones like oxygen, these hormones that are traveling and allowing for this differential growth we were speaking of. So the combination of all these features is what allows plants to exhibit the type of movements we were talking about, but without the need of, of muscles proper understood mm -hmm. as animal, animal muscles, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you will have, think of the, when we are speaking of the swelling and the shrinking of, of certain parts of the cells, yes. or think of the, think of the motor cells, think of, of for example, the, the gar cells. So the gar cells are these tiny cells that surround the stomata, you know, like the tiny pores on the leaves. Mm -hmm. So those cells can swell and shrink and will, as a result, allow for the stomata to open or close. So, to open or close, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that will prevent, say, plants for, from dehydrating. You shut the stomata when mm -hmm. you don't want to dehydrate or you can use them, for, to, for example, to avoid some form of contamination, bacterial contamination, because they will, this bacteria will enter the plant through the stomata. So you can have different behaviors that have an objective that are mediated by, by different movements that are mm -hmm. driven, driven by, by those changes in turgor pressure, differential go growth, uh, movements in terms of, of cellular walls. And all this together combined gives you this complex behavioral repertoire in the form of growth, patterns of growth that we can appreciate in plants. Mm. Okay, but at this point, someone who's skeptical of plants possibly having intelligence or minds could come and say, yeah, okay, fine. They have behavior, that kind of behavior, and perhaps other behaviors we'll talk about later. But what does that have necessarily to do with cognition? I mean, couldn't it be the case that these behaviors are just automatic? Oh, ab absolutely, like absolutely. So that's precisely uh, our our work, pending the pending work. So precisely to tell those two apart. Mm -hmm. But that's the very same project that you should bear in mind if you're studying if you're studying honeybees, ants, termites, or whatever any animal mm -hmm. species. So you've got to distinguish in between those automatisms, those hardwired responses, from the truly flexible ones that require some level of history yeah. on behalf of an individual. So not just code it in your genes and just provide the response that is hardwired, mm -hmm. but are flexible in the sense that, hey, depending on your previous history, depending on what you have been exposed to, yeah. you will exhibit one type of behavior or another. So give, just to give you the easiest example to illustrate this, learning. You won't learn the same type of things because learning will depend on the previous history of the individual. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have to pay attention, not just what come to what comes in your genes, providing those hardwired responses, but on top of that, what sort of behaviors depend or reflect to some extent the experiences, the particular experiences of different individuals. So different plants belonging to the same species might respond differently because one of them has been exposed to one training regime and mm -hmm. another one to a different training regime. And then we would be speaking of something that belongs to the individual, not to the evolutionary line as such. Hmm. But yeah, I, I agree. That's, that's precisely one of the objectives, to tell those two apart. But so there's evidence that plants are able to learn? Yeah. So here, here there, is, um, there is more robust evidence, mm -hmm. more controversial evidence, 
evidence that still requires a degree of uh, that needs to be replicated by independent labs. That's actually something we are doing at the moment in our lab. Okay. So take take the take the easiest the easiest example. So the easiest example is is habituation. Remember we spoke of of um, we spoke of of uh, mimosa, right? Mimosa pudica. Mm -hmm. So in the case of of mimosa pudica, we know these plants can be habituated, right? So what what's think of habituation? What, what's habituation about? Okay, you should you, you have the repeated presentation of some type of stimulus, right? Mm -hmm. And then after a while, you will get you will see that the response diminishes. You get habituated to it, right? So mm -hmm. if you're touching the leaf of the of the mimosa, it will fall. Then you wait for it to recover, it will fall again. You wait for it, it will. So you keep touching it, and it will keep <laughs> folding, right? After a while, after a while, it won't fold anymore. Now, up to this point, we have a good reason, as you mentioned before, to be a skeptic, because we need to have good controls. So you might say, "Hey, hold on a sec. Now the mimosa is not folding anymore, but maybe simply because it's exhausted." Is so tired of folding and unfolding, folding and unfolding, folding and unfolding. Maybe it's just exhausted. So you have to discard the alternative hypothesis that the plant had gone through some form of motor fatigue. Remember, we spoke of the motor cells. Mm -hmm. So if the motor cells are not able to swell and shrink anymore, if there is no more swelling and shrinking, it won't be able to perform this, this folding behavior. And then you might have concluded incorrectly that the plant had learned by habituation when it was simply exhausted, okay? So that's why you need to do good science. You need to have good controls. So once you have discarded the alternative hypothesis that it was due to motor fatigue, the behavior that you observe, and another alternative hypothesis say that there was some form of sensory adaptation, right? Mm -hmm. If you discard those uh, hypotheses, alternative hypotheses, then you have a good reason to believe that plants are able to learn by habituation. Now, in the case of habituation, we have pretty good, you know, decent evidence to, to hold it as, as, you know, uh, as a good working hypothesis. Now, more sophisticated forms of learning, such as associative learning, uh, think of Pavlov's dog, right? Mm -hmm. This has been reported in the literature but people are skeptical, and with a good reason. I am skeptical with a good reason, simply that we need to wait for those results to be replicated mm -hmm. by other labs. Yeah. But this is just the ABC of the scientific method. I mean, the same goes for honeybees, for rats, for birds, and for humans, for that matter. Mm -hmm. So because this field is so young, is such a immature field of research, as a result, many of the results, if you think of the literature I'm reporting, many papers are just, you know, just came out in the last few years. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that that's good or bad literature. It means that this really recent literature. So that's the great thing about a field of research that is thriving, that everything is yet awaiting to be confirmed, replicated. So in that case, here, in our case, for example, we are now in the middle of running these replication studies to confirm or not that plants are able to learn by association. We'll, we'll be able to report to report to headquarters our results, hopefully during 2024. But this is the type of examples I was meaning to say. There is a healthy sense of ethical, let's do good science, and that takes time. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, let's bear in mind something which is more important than the empirical results themselves, which is the theoretical framework. Because sometimes many people are far too obsessed with the data, with the evidence, as if evidence or data didn't come with a theoretical framework. Now, right. think, about, think about the theoretical framework itself. Why good plants want to be able to associate between different stimuli? What's the theoretical reason? Why would we suspect or why would it be a good conjecture to make to think that plants might be able to do this? Well, precisely because they are sessile, precisely because they are slow, because they have to grow to get to their targets. Mm -hmm. So imagine, imagine you, you, you are in, in Lisbon, say Lisbon, um, you live in the outskirts, and then you need to walk to get to the train station and takes you 45 minutes to walk there. You'd better make sure you get to the right station, right? You don't mm -hmm. want to get there 
spent 20, 45 minutes to get there to find out that the train was leaving from a different station. So you want to make sure you know where you're going because you cannot afford to miss your target because it takes so long, right? Mm -hmm. So plants grow slowly, so they better know where they're getting, right? They right. might not have the time to try again and get to another station, right? So that means that they have to evolve nice tricks to tell what sort of information can be a good cue, what sort of information can be predictive of other information. Oh, this might mean that. Oh, so they need to be sensitive to different information, to different regularities in the environment. Mm -hmm. Oh, when these things happen, statistically, this thing usually is followed by this other thing. Oh, I'm going to pay attention to that regularity because it pays off. Yeah. So that's the type of trick that allows you to behave anticipatorily. So we have good reasons theoretical reasons to believe that this is a framework worth exploring. Now, a different issue is let's do the experiments, let's test the hypothesis, and mm -hmm. then we we'll see what we have. Think of, in the case of learning and memory, you have even greater, I mean, you have very nice examples. There are some plants that you know what they do, that what they do is they, they, they adjust presentation based based on the on the on, on the previous visiting intervals of pollinators. So depending on the frequency of those visits by pollinators, they adjust the way they present their pollen and the quantity, the concentration. Mm -hmm. They don't want to waste resources. You see, this cannot be hardwired because this requires you to be sensible, to be sensitive to yeah. the type of frequencies and the guys who is coming around and what sort of regularities are happening there to fine tune to fine tune to optimize the way you present your precious gift in the form of pollen to be taken to another flower so mm -hmm. that's what i meant about being sensible being sensitive to all these uh, irregularities out there hmm. so that I, yeah yeah so let me ask you now about another kind of topic so plants communicate with one another, right? Mm. Plants of the same species and sometimes plants of other species. So how do they do that? Oh, oh, they, they do it through many different channels, okay? Mm -hmm. So they use what we call VOX, not volatile organic compounds, airborne, airborne volatiles. So you have molecules, airborne, that uh, they, they travel from, you know, being emitted at one point and they can be spread and go from one part of the tree or the plant to another part of the same tree or plant or to a different one. So they mm -hmm. spread airborne and surely they can allow you to anticipatorily put up defensive measures. Oh, this, there is this munching caterpillar. There is this herbivore attacking me, biting my branches or my leaves. I'm going to emit these, these SOS signals that such that other plants or the plant or, or in the vicinity can anticipatorily put the type of measures, implement the type of measures, early warnings. So this is early warnings to, 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 to become, you know, to, to secrete toxins, to yeah. do whatever can do to, to put them off, to put the herbivores off, right? So that, those are volatiles, but they can use many other things. So actually they are very sensitive to, to sound vibrations, right? There is a new field, again, really recent, it's thriving, uh, is, is, is phytoacoustics. So, so, so there is sensitivity to, 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 to noises, to sounds, uh, to sound vibrations, right? Uh, so there is acoustic interaction in between plants and invertebrates, for example. You know, some plants, like take the, take the Arabidopsis, it's like the model plant, right? Uh, par excellence, right? Mm -hmm. in, 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 in plant molecular biology. So in Arabidopsis, we know that they can discriminate the vibrations produced by munching caterpillars from the vibrations produced by the wind or by the song of insects. So they will tell in between those different vibrations to know if this guy is munching, is eating me, or is just like playing a song, right? Or sometimes you have flowers being exposed to, to, to sounds of, of, of the same frequency in, in the, I mean, in laboratory conditions, right? So mm -hmm. we, you can expose them to sounds of the same frequency 
as the sounds produced by some flying pollinator, right? Mm -hmm. And then they, they will be, you know, producing sweeter nectar when exposed to those vibrations, increasing, of course, the chances of cross-pollination. So they will be pulling the, th the strings. They are the, the pollinator is kind of the puppet and the flowers are pulling the strings and saying they can rely on that type of information. Oh, from sound vibrations, for, from vibrational cues, they can tell who is around and how important it is because you don't, be, you don't want to be wasting a sweeter nectar. You want to use your sweeter beats for the real good guys, the one that are gonna give you the best chance of cross-pollination, right? Mm -hmm. So so if you put this this type of, uh, I mean, communication, of course, take, takes many, I mean, many different forms. You just need to realize, I mean, when you spoke before, when you spoke before of, of, of hey, plants, you know, have no neurons, have no nervous system, yeah, uh, um, we need to re we need to think what is it that they are reacting to what is it that they are responding to so it could be they could be responding to volatiles as we said the vox volatile organic compounds many different i mean there are thousands of different molecules they can be secreting or responding to they can mm -hmm. be responding to vibrations you know just a, a caterpillar chewing mm -hmm. the frequency of a caterpillar chewing the, the B bus, no? uh, that, those examples that we mentioned, but mm -hmm. of course they can be responding to mechanical stimulation, to being swayed or being shaken or to the wind or to touch. They can be responding to different, many, many different patterns of information related to light. So think of a, think of a pattern of shade avoidance. Sometimes it, it's not just that they have light sensitive proteins for different parts of the spectrum. So they, they, they will be sensing red, they will be sensing blue, they will be sensing yeah. far red. So is that is that they are sensing the ratios. So they can tell the proportion in between those two. So so for example, think of a behavior like think of shade avoidance. When a plant is growing out of shade, so it's telling that there is a lot of guys over here, a lot of neighbors, and I'm gonna grow in the other direction, they can tell that because they are computing they are processing information related to the ratio of red to far red light because mm -hmm. of course plants are absorbing red but they are reflecting far red so that's why you see them green right because they absorb the red and the blue mm -hmm. right you see them green so if they are absorbing the red and the blue they can sense they are sensitive to the ratio of red to far red light or the ratio of blue to green light and that means that by seeing how those ratios change in relation to the direction of growth, they can say, oh, when I grow in this direction, the ratio goes up. When I grow in this direction, the ratio goes down. Oh, I'm gonna go in this direction because there are less guys absorbing red. That's open space. So you see, they can use many different cues to make meaning out of their surroundings, to know what they need to be doing, mm -hmm. to grow directionally in one direction and not the other, etc. And there are many other different different uh, parameters they can be sensing. You know, if you think in terms of water, they just they don't just grow because there is water. Of course, they they can sense variations in the supply of water. Mm -hmm. They can tell drought. They can tell if there is flooding. They can tell if there is a gradient of humidity. If there is you know uh, salinity, snow being melted. So they can tell all, all these different things, not just water being there. Yeah. So they, so they can use different anticipatory behaviors to say, hey, a, a, a drought is coming, but I, don't, I might not even, you, you mentioned communication, right? Mm -hmm. So they might not even be sensing drought itself. Drought can be whispered from one plant to the next. So that happens through the roots. So some roots mm -hmm. can be telling the neighbor, hey, drought is here, it's here, not there yet. But they can whisper, hey, you know that drought is coming, this gradient. And then that way they can reduce, they can lower uh, their, you know, metabolic machinery mm -hmm. to avoid wasting resources because things will get worse in the future. Mm -hmm. so, they, so they can adjust ahead of time. So, yeah, yeah, this is, you know, it's a fascinating field. There's so many things to find out. Yeah. So another thing that you talk about in the book is how you find the differences between 
domesticated plants and oh, wild yeah. plants. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, could you tell us about some of the most important differences or most distinct differences there? And uh, why does it matter? Yeah, well, it, it matters a lot and for a number of reasons. Okay. So first, think that, that, that when we study plants, we barely remember, we need to say, hey, Paco, remind yourself that all the plants in the lab that you are time-lapsing, no, that's what we do in the lab, we observe their behavior through time-lapse time photography. When we are time-lapsing plants, to speed them up and see their behavior, right? Uh, the plants that we study, they are all domesticated because right. we've been domesticating them for thousands of years since right. the origins of agriculture, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, this means that we've been selecting them. This is not different from your pet. I mean, your dog was a wolf 30,000 years ago. So we've been shaping them through selection, right? So we've been shaping plants through selecting them, right? Mm -hmm. So as a result, we have created plants and we have shaped their body plan, their anatomy, their morphology. So the clearest case in which they become, uh, I would say, their behavior less interesting is, think of a climbing plant, okay, a vine. Mm -hmm. If through agriculture, I'm planting a plant here and I provide a pole nearby, just a support. Yeah. The plant doesn't need to make any effort because the pole is always there. So they just twine around. Mm -hmm. That's what we do in agriculture. We you know, think of your, you know, your garden, your, your greens, tomato yeah. plants, beans, peas, whatever. Right. So, so we just provide the support. And we've been doing that for thousands of years. As a result, the type of plants that we have uh, developed are like like our pet dog compared to a wolf we have plants that the internode length the internode length is this is the shoot the stem in between two nodes if there is a node here and a node here this is that distance in between nodes so mm -hmm. the internode length has been shortened right and by shortening it think what we do in the lab we put a, a top camera to do time lapse right so we can see from the top the pattern of movement. So imagine now looking at the camera, imagine the camera is looking at the tip of the plant, right? So so that is doing something like this. If if this shortens, if I'm very short, I can only do like this, a very small cir circular movement, right? Mm -hmm. So it will be just doing like this. And doesn't really need to do that much because after all the pole is nearby. So I'm gonna hit it mm -hmm. as long as, you know, I will grow maybe just a couple of loops and eventually, I will just touch the pole and twine around. So it doesn't really matter that, that, that I'm so short. But in wild plants, in wild plants, you don't have a human person, a guy nearby providing a pole to say, hey, come here. They need to find their own way through. Uh, so they can't afford to miss it. They've, need to be, they've got to be smart. Now, as a result, they haven't shortened because we haven't been selecting them. So they have a longer distance in between nodes. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you have a longer body that you can sway more? So just you don't do this tiny movement, but you move way more, you know. So if we are, if we are time lapsing these wild plants from the top, as we do with the domesticated exemplars, we will see a different pattern of movement. We will see them zigzagging, exploring, because as a matter of fact, they need to explore their surroundings way more richly because they are not being provided a pole. So they need to find out a host tree somewhere nearby to twine around and go up there to do photosynthesis. So you see, domesticated and wild plants have different bodies. And as a result, they will exhibit different behaviors. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, just talking a little bit about the biochemistry of plants, how much of it uh, do we also see in animals? Hmm. <laughs> Way more than people think, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 chemicals, the, let me put it this way. So the type of chemicals that we do know that play a role 
as neurotransmitters mm -hmm. in animals, right? Mm -hmm. You have them in plants. So okay. not not analog molecules, not the same molecules, right? Mm -hmm. So you so acetylcholine, uh, dopamine, histamine, noradrenaline, serotonin, glutamate, GABA. So all these neurotransmitters that we are familiar with from neurochemistry, mm -hmm. plants have them. Now, this is funny because when you find them in plants, we, of course, we don't like to call them neuro, neurotransmitters. We call them biomediators. But the, the interesting thing is not whether they serve to communicate in between two neurons yeah. through a synapse, through a synapse, right? Mm -hmm. It's the fact that the question, the real question is whether they are signaling molecules, whether they serve a signaling role. And they do sometimes serve that role, right? So you have, like, for example, well, GABA, we know, GABA in plants, we know it's a signaling, it's a signaling molecule. But think of, think of glutamate. So in, in, sometimes in glutamate, in plants, I mean, we know mm -hmm. that it triggers, it triggers long distance plant defense signaling. So you have, for a plant that is being eaten by a herbivore, sometimes with glutamate, it, 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 it triggers a calcium wave that spreads throughout the plant and allows the plant to put up all this defensive machinery in place. So this long distance signaling is mediated by those molecules. So that type of neurochemistry is in place. Now, remember when we used the Penguin Dictionary definition of behavior? Yeah. Now, this, this is funny because now we are working um, uh, in my lab we, with a, a postdoc in my lab, Miguel Segundo. We wrote a target article for the journal Animal Sentience, right? Mm -hmm. and in 2023. And the article is called Plant Sentience uh, Between Skepticism and Romanticism Science. Like the, mes the, the message of the target article is to say, hey, let's do the science. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be romantic or a skeptic by default. Let's, we just need to do the science and find out, right? Whether plants are sentient or not. Now, you know what type of response we got from the orthodoxy, from the, the orthodox skeptical attitude coming from reductionist plant physiologists. So we mm -hmm. had the type of plant physiologist response really skeptical. And they say, no, no, no. They cannot have this signaling role. They cannot have neurotransmitters because Actually, they even cite the Wikipedia. So they go to the Wikipedia and say, hey, the Wikipedia defines neurotransmitter as related to the synapse. Since plants have no synapses, because there are no neurons and no synapses, they cannot use neurotransmitters. So you th you, do you see how narrow-minded this approach is? So mm -hmm. instead of revising the definition in light of the new discoveries, yeah. they just stick to the setting stone definition and reject that these other guys can be using those molecules for the same sort of signaling purposes mm -hmm. because the definition is not meant to be touched. Well, mm -hmm. isn't it easier to revise definitions, which is what we do on a regular basis? That's happened, by the way, in many other instances. Think of, think of um, um, melatonin. Melatonin of course, we know from, from the animal literature, it was actually discovered in the 60s or 50s or 60s in the bovine cattle, right? Uh, and it, it's secreted by the, by the pineal gland. And we know it has to do with relieving stress, putting you to sleep, getting you, you know, in sync with your circadian clock and the, you know, the day-night cycle. So, well, actually, what happens when you cross the pond? If, if you fly to the States or Brazil or whatever? What happens when you cross the pond? That you get jet lagged, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, because we are out of sync, so our internal clocks are ticking to your local time, and all of a sudden you are in the east coast of the states, and they say, "Hey, what's going on? My body is telling me that this should be the time." And no, the sun is not doing what it should be doing. I have a conflict in between the information that comes from the outside, the light coming from the outside, and what my clock tells me. And that conflict it requires a few days. No? Sometimes, mm -hmm. even a few days, for you to go back to normal. Yeah. To kick your clocks 
back in sync with the local time zone, right? Right. Now we know we use melatonin for that. Melatonin allows you to go in sync. And sometimes people go to the pharmacy and buy melatonin tablets, right? Mm -hmm. Now, plants biosynthesize their own melatonin. Now, this is so funny. This is in relation to this idea of how narrow-minded we are. If you see the way plants do it, uh, you see that it relates. For example, in, in legumes. So legumes fold their leaves at night, right? So when the sun sets, they actually, they fold their leaves before the sun sets. So they anticipate the sunset. Mm -hmm. And before the sun rises in the morning, they unfold their leaves, right? So this is anticipatory behavior. Of course, it's circadian based. So the plant's circadian clocks are telling the plant when is the time to fold their leaves and unfold them. But this pattern that is in sync with the day-night cycles is regulated by melatonin. So you see the peak of melatonin is in the evening, just before going to bed, folding their leaves. The same with humans. We have the peak of melatonin. And during the day, it wears off. So you see this peak and this wearing off. That happens in plants as well. The molecule is the same molecule. And yet, when people see the molecule, they don't want to identify it because we have this, you see what I meant about anthropocentric, the, the anthropocentric eye being in the eye of the skeptic. Mm -hmm. So they assume that this molecule belongs to us. It's an animal thing. So if you're a plant, you cannot have it. So it was only discovered in 1995. And it took 10 more years for the scientific community to agree upon its existence and give it a name, a proper name. So the scientific community only reached a consensus in 2004 or something. They took almost 10, 10 years more. And now you know what name they gave it? Phytomelatonin. So they thought that they, they felt the urge to add the prefix phyto to tell it apart from the real melatonin, which is our melatonin. You see how how arrogant we are, humans, that we think that things belong to us. And if you also have it, okay, I'm going to add a different prefix, just to make sure we don't share it, <laughs> even terminologically speaking. Yeah. So you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, hmm. And so, but in the book you argue that plants have minds. But what mm. does it really mean to have a mind and particularly so in a plant? Well, look, let's, let's, ask it, let's ask it in a Sesame Street way. Real simple. Imagine I returned you the question and I said, what does it mean to say that dogs have minds? <laughs> you see? Yeah. So, so... So to treat any organism whatsoever on a par, to treat them all equally, means that our epistemic situation is not different. So if you have a, if you have a pet, if you, if you, I don't know if you have dogs or cats, but if you have a pet, very probably you think that it has a personality, that your, your dog or your cat is, is, is kind of, you know, more, more, sometimes they are more open or more, Close, you know, they have different, they behave differently, right? Mm -hmm. They all have their personalities. Yeah. I, I, I can imagine very few pet owners denying that their pets have minds. Um, have they seen the mind of their pets? They cannot possibly. No. What do they do? They infer their mentality from their how, behavior out of the overt behavior they observe, what they do? They can track the neural correlates of their minds. So that's what we do in cognitive neuroscience, right? Mm -hmm. So you can attach yeah. electrodes or you can do an EMG. You, you, you can take many neuroimaging techniques, an fMRI, you can put a, someone in a scan and see what lights up in their, in their brain when they are performing a cognitive task, right? So imagine you are doing this with an animal uh, performing some task. And then you see, oh, yeah, sure, this flux, this lights up. You can see it on the screen. Now, you can, you can pair it, you can pair that with the behavior that you're observing. So when you observe this behavior, this lights up. And you can have both windows onto the mind of your pet, 
right? So literally, we can do the same. That doesn't mean, so this is the mistake. The mistake is to think that because the methodology is the same, the type of mind is the same. And no, we are not saying that. Mm -hmm. We are saying that the methodology is the same to unearth their own minds. That doesn't need to be like yours. So that's again the mistake. Now, what do we mean by applying the same methodology? Can we do the same type of neuroimaging? No. We have to customize it in the very same way that we have to customize the learning protocols. Re remember we mentioned Polov's dog. So if you have a dog and you are testing for associative learning, you have a protocol. You have controls, you have to apply the stimuli, you, have, you need an inter-stimulus interval, some time to present an stimulus and then the next. They can be overlapped. If they are not, we call it trace conditioning. So we can do many mm -hmm. things. So you can have a, a protocol in the learning literature. And you can customize that protocol from dogs to test for associative learning in honeybees. So in that case, you would be customizing your mammal, your mammalian learning protocol to be applied to an insect. Why do you need to customize it? Because the stimuli presentation will have to differ by necessity because they will be sensing different things, their sensory apparatus is different, the timing is different, so you have to customize it to be presented to your new model organism, right? In a plant, you are doing exactly the same. You will need to think hard how to customize your learning protocols to be applicable to plants, not to invertebrates, you see? Mm -hmm. And the same goes for the neuroimaging. Plants have no neurons. But yet, you can do an MRI. You can do a PET scan to a plant. You can do that. I mean, you mm -hmm. have machines to do it. Um, right. By the way, if you know of any philanthropist, tell me because those machines are very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, those machines cost a fortune, but they've been devised, mm -hmm. they are designed. You can use them. So what I'm getting here is that it's not, this is not an exercise in, you know, this, this is not a thought experiment. We have the technology. We just need to open up our mind to customize those protocols. Then if we are observing their behavior, if we are flagging, if we are seeing what lights up within their bodies, in this case, we would be speaking not of the neural correlates of their mentality, of their minds, yeah. but of their vascular correlates right? Electrical mm -hmm. activity flowing yeah. throughout their vascular system. Now, if we can highlight that and compare it and check it against the behavioral repertoire that we are also observing through time-lapse photography, we have the equivalent methodological tool to approach the study of the, the minds of plants. That doesn't mean that the mind of the plant equals the mind of, their, of your dog. They will be different by necessity because they have different problems. They put up different solutions. So evolution gave them a different bag of tricks. They do different things, but the methodology is the same. We can import it, but we need to customize it. Mm -hmm. But with plant minds in mind, <laughs> uh, the... Uh, do you think that there's any evidence that they experience things like emotions, pain, or right. that they even have consciousness? Sure. So, well, I mentioned to you that, that we had published this article called Plant Sentience, and we say between skepticism and romanticism, science, let's do the science. That's what we said, right? Yeah. So here, the very same thing applies. Um, well, this is something I, I explain in the later chapters in the book, right? Mm -hmm. so, so without doing many spoilers, uh, what I can say is that, is that, again, think, let's do the same exercise. How do you know if, you're, if a, an animal is sentient, if it is able to exhibit subjective experience, have emotions, mm -hmm. feel pain? Yeah. Can you see an animal feeling pain? No. You don't see the pain itself. Mm -hmm. You can see an aversive response. You can see how it's 
fleeing away, moving away from some noxious source of stimulation or something nasty, they move away, right? You can do many things. You can see the role of analgesics or you can use anesthetics. Yeah. Well, this is not a spoiler because as you well know, the book kicks off with you know, the very first chapter with a plant being anesthetized. Mm -hmm. So, so put it in this, put it in these terms. If you put a plant to sleep with the very same type of anesthetics that you use when you take your pet to the vet, think what happens when your vet comes out of, when your pet comes out of anesthesia, right? So when your pet comes out of anesthesia, it's like, is is going back to normal, right? It's recovering something mm -hmm. that, it has lost temporarily. Right. So you say, hey, my dog was anesthetized. Now it's back to normal. It, you know, it's mentality pops up. Oh, it's back to, oh, hey, how are you doing? It recognizes you, waxes his tail. So back to normal. Now we see in plants, they're going back to normal. You can anesthetize a mimosa and it won't fold their leaves when you touch it because it's fully anesthetized. Now, when it comes out of anesthesia, when the anesthetic, the drug wears off, little by little, it will come back to normal. It will again fold. Now, why don't we ask the very same question? Why don't we say, oh, what does, what has the plant recovered that had lost temporarily? You see? Mm -hmm. You see that the epistemic situation is not different. Yeah. It, it's just harder for us to think about it because we are so used to simply projecting our idea of mentality that comes first person perspective. Yeah. Of course, I can think of my own mentality, my emotions, my inner life, my subjective experience, because it's the only one I have direct access to. And then the rest for me to think that you also have a mind is a leap, it's an inference. But of course, it could be really weird that I am the one and only person with subjective experiences on planet Earth or the universe, it's easier to think that all human beings are like me in that respect. And then you start to see what other animals are like. And then we say, of course, you know, mammals are sentient. From their behavior, we can tell they do things that they are pretty much in, you know, we are on the same page to some extent. Yeah. We suspect that they are going through, you know, bad moments in their lives and or good moments and they are happy or they are sad or they are they are feeling miserable you know if, if you have a pet you know what i mean but when this question was first raised in the case of honeybees people laughed people say come on mammals yes but not insects now there is a lot of research in emotions in insects we speak of honeybee sentience and Again, you cannot observe their sentience directly. You can infer it out of what? Of what they call indicators or markers of sentience. There is a mm -hmm. marker of sentience, an indicator of sentience, and it could be, I mentioned before, trace conditioning, a form of associative learning, where there is a temporal gap in between the presentation of the stimuli, and we suspect that, oh, if there is some trace in between, you are able to associate one stimuli with the other because you retain it in your head. That's the trace. Well, imagine, as I mentioned, we are trying to replicate these experiments on associative learning. Imagine we discover, we found next year, maybe, that plants exhibit trace conditioning, which is being used as of today as a marker of sentience in invertebrates. Mm -hmm. Would we deny that they are sentient despite passing the same test that is being used for animals? You see, are we yeah. redefining it or? So again, my message is let's drop all these prejudices and let's do the science, regardless right. of the kingdom of precedence, regardless of whether it's a fungi, a plant or an animal, because we might find out, we might identify that master key I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. that works to open any branch in the tree of life. Right. So let me ask you one last question. And of course, I'm aware of the fact that we're talking about science here, not so much philosophy, but still, do you think <laughs> that, still. <laughs> yeah, but still, do you think that this would have any potential ethical 
implications. I mean, since oh. in recent times, in yeah. lots of places, people sure, care, sure. care about, for example, animal rights, because sure. we are now more aware of the fact that animals or many animals have subjective experiences and they experience pain and different kinds of emotions they suffer and so on and so forth do you think that um, if one day we know that the plants experience similar sorts of things that would have ethical implications mm. as well yeah yeah no no that's a great question absolutely i mean uh, actually you see uh, this is what i find intriguing about many people's skeptical attitude. Sometimes I have found this response in the scientific community. Some people are skeptical about plant sentience, not because of all these things we were talking about, passing the test of trace conditioning, mm -hmm. being anesthetized and then coming out of anesthesia. Right. Not about these examples, but because of the ethical implications, the dilemma this puts up against. And that's the real problem, that many people feel so uncomfortable about the implications that they prefer to deny the very fact that we are trying to discover scientifically. And that cannot be done this way. I mean, you cannot say this doesn't exist because if it existed, oh my God, what are we going to do? So you cannot deny the existence because the consequences are difficult to deal with. Yeah. If 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 there is a fact of the matter as to whether plants are sentient or not, let's discuss it scientifically. And then imagine we reach a conclusion, positive conclusion. Yeah, they pass the tests that we apply to insects, they are sentient. Imagine, we are not there by no means, but imagine mm -hmm. we get there. Yeah. You cannot say no we have to ignore those tests or those tests don't apply because they were plants and have no neurons. No, no, we have to say, oh, yes, sure. We have the same reason to believe they are sentient if those tests were used to discuss insect sentience. Now we need to detach, to separate that fact of the matter, whichever way it goes, from the ethical or moral implications, right? Now, what happens when we discuss those? I don't have an answer for those, so I, I, don't, I don't know what the outcome should be. But I do know that what I find funny is that the discussion here, as with vegans and vegetarians, right? So many times people tell me, oh my God, Paco, sometimes I give a talk and you have people in the audience and they go like, raise their hand and I say, oops, you, you, you ruined my day. I thought I was safe being a vegan or a vegetarian and now you're telling me what, that I should feed on stones? I should chew stones or what? And then I say, no, 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 no. I don't mean to say that by no means. This is a fact of the matter. Now let's discuss the consequences, the ethical, the philosophical consequences, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the consequences might be that we need to rethink root and branch. We need to rethink root and branch our approach to how we treat whichever form of food ends up being on my plate, on my dish, okay. right? So for example, instead of thinking in terms of kingdoms, because nowadays people think in terms of kingdoms, I eat or I don't eat this because belongs to the animal kingdom or belongs to the plant kingdom. As if that division in itself was telling you whether those organisms had been suffering or not. Yeah. You see what I mean? So what really counts, imagine we erase all the borders. We erase the borders in between kingdoms. Imagine we only think of the tree of life as such. Because after all, divisions are conventions. So there is one thing which is life, the tree of life, full of life. Let's just think which organisms, no borders, no distinction in between kingdoms, end up being on my plate. Why don't we think what sources of stress, of suffering, those organisms went through unnecessarily before becoming my food. You see, now we could mm -hmm. discuss whether, oh, that food, when it was an organism, didn't need, it, didn't need to go through that form of stress. It was unnecessary in terms of the handling, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So maybe 
our choices should follow those lines and not divisions by kingdoms. So you see, there is there are different ways out of the ethical dilemma. But whichever way you go, whichever choices you make, what I'm convinced is that they cannot drive the answer to the question whether plants are sentient or not. Okay. Great. So let's end on that note. We've already explored many topics from the book here today, and it is again Plant uh, Sapiens, the new science of plant intelligence. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box of this interview. Uh, and Paco, just before we go apart from the book, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, well, again, thanks for having me. It was great. I really enjoyed the, the conversation. And, and, and yeah, uh, if maybe the easiest way for people to Google me up and see what we are up to is Mint Lab. That's M-I-N-T-L-A-B. Mm -hmm. So Mint Lab is the minimal intelligence lab, Mint yeah. Lab at the University of Murcia. So if people Google me up, they, will, they should be able to find the lab site and check out what we are doing, the publications and the experiments we are running and what's going on in the lab. And all sorts of information is there. And we try to keep it updated. It's not easy because we are busy, but, you know, we try to keep it updated as much as we can. And yeah, and the book, Planta Sapiens, the same, they should be able to find it anywhere. It's all over the place. It's been translated to many languages as of today. You know, that's the English, the American translation, mm -hmm. the new science of plant intelligence. But it came out in 2023 in Portuguese, in Italian, in Spanish. Now it's been translated into in Japanese, has also yeah. been translated. So it's, it's, people should find it translated to many different languages and I hope that you will enjoy reading it. Okay, great. So thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been fun to talk to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Came out in 2023 in Portuguese, in Italian, in Spanish. Now it's been translated into in Japanese, has also yeah. been translated. So it's, it's, people should find it translated to many different languages and I hope that you will enjoy reading it. Okay, great. So thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been fun to talk to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon and PayPal. The links are in the description down below. And also please share, like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Perga Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunde, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Nassi, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, Mikkel Stormier, Samuel Andre, Francis Forte, Agnunus, Fergal Cousin, Hal Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, John Nyar, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, John Weira, Tom Hummel, Sadus Franz, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desaraújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Anik Punta, Radana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stazewski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madsen, Gary G. Hellman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentin, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiesman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Stiofanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Morey, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheist, Larry Dilley Jr., Old Herringbone, Starry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grass, Isigor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandin, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Paul Crowley, Kate Von Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hurtner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings and David Pinsoff. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Egdam, Bernard Hugh, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Giancarlo Montenegro, Alnick Ortiz, Nick Golden, 
and Rosie, and to my executive producers Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.